look at a few things that where this becomes applicable. Um, the body can conduct electricity. But the, um, the current you experience is dependent on the resistance and the voltage. All right, so that means the resistance, say, of your body, and then the voltage of your source, whatever it is that you're touching. So if you, you know, if you have little bitty fingers and you stick them inside the holes over there, you'll get a certain voltage. Whereas if you just stick them onto a nine volt battery, then you get a different voltage. So the current that you receive depends upon the voltage source, and then also where the current is flowing through your body. So like if you have them go through your thumb and forefinger, that's a pretty big or small resistance if I have current that travels through my thumb and forefinger as composed or as compared to say traveling from my hand over to my other hand is that a big or a small resistance it's fairly small especially if it's wet uh, in fact you might see electricians sometimes electricians used to do this a lot they don't do it so much anymore because meters are really cheap and it's really easy to determine if there's electricity in a in a wire but used to you know what they did and even some still today they would just touch the wire. And if it shocked them, then they would know that there was <laughs> electricity there. And uh, sometimes they'd even lick their fingers and touch it. Um, so like really old electricians, they just sort of lose feeling in their hands and their appendages because of that. But anyway, um, wet skin has a lower resistance. And because it has a lower resistance, it's going to have a larger current for a given voltage. Because remember, V is equal to I times R. So if I make R get smaller, that means that I'll have more current. I'm resisting the flow of electricity less, so I get more electric flow, more electric charges to flow. Uh, there is a table of currents and their effects on people on page 158. I'll just sort of direct that to you. You don't need to know the numbers, but most people can feel about, um, about one milliamp of current. Uh, 100 milliamps can cause fatal defibrillation. And 300 milliamps can cause burns. Just sort of to give you a feel for, you know, the currents that can damage you. And then when they defibrillate the heart, do you all remember how, what kind of current is used to do that? No. It was 6,000 amps. So actually 6,000 amps go through your heart to cause it to start beating again. Um, the amount of current the body receives is heavily dependent upon the, the path that it takes through the body. For example, from hand to foot, not like the, uh, isn't that like an illness or something, hand to foot? Is that an illness? Like to hand, foot, and mouth. Not like that. But that means literally like you grab a wire here, and the current flows through your arm down to your foot, from your hand all the way down to your foot. So it's like your whole body becomes a resistor. So that, for example, will be a much larger resistance and hence a lower current than, say, from index finger to thumb or across your chest. Meaning across your chest you grab a wire here and a wire here and the current flows directly across your arms. And of course that's going to go through your heart and it can cause other issues. Uh, one application of this is the e-meter. You ever heard of the e-meter? I'm not sure if any of y'all are Scientologists. I'm not, but uh, there aren't many around here. But a Scientologist is, uh, I don't want to say a cult because it might offend you, but it is. It's a cult, basically. Uh, are there any Scientologists? I'm sorry, I shouldn't say that. 
But anyway, uh, they, I think it's a cult. I think that's fair to say. Uh, Scientologists, it's it's a religious movement of sorts, uh, and it, it's largely based on the e-meter. They use an e-meter to measure the resistance of your body. And, you know, it works because it can tell you, like, for example, when a person's lying or when they're anxious or when they're just having sort of bad thoughts. And so they use the e-meter as a psychological tool of sorts. People grab the two, uh, <coughs> these two things right here, these two little bars, and it just puts a very low current through their body and measures the resistance of their body. So, like, for example, if their palms are sweaty, you know, that's an indication of anxiety, then it will cause the resistance of their body to decrease because, you know, wet skin is less, has less resistance. Or even if their heart rate is elevated, it causes a slight change in the resistance of their body. So it's pretty good, actually, at determining psychological effects on the body because the body responds to those things. Um, so this is Scientology uh, and the e-meter measures the resistance of the body to uh, um, indicate Psychological, uh, let's see, P S Y. Issues. I'll, I'll just call them issues. I think they call them like bad thoughts or something. I forget. They have a technical term for it in their whole scheme of beliefs. But they use this to, to determine, you know, if you have sort of bad things, quote, bad things going on in your mind. Right, that's the E meter. Uh, we won't use the e-meter in this class, but we will use the in-body. This is, you've probably seen this, if you're, especially if you're uh, athletic training. This is a device that allows you to measure the muscle makeup of your body. Uh, it measures the amount of water in your body, the amount of muscle mass, the amount of bone mass. And what it does, you stand on this little platform right here, and you grab these two handles. We'll look at this on the last day of class when we go over the rec center. So do you all have one back in athletic training? An in-body scanner. You know what I'm talking about? You've seen one? Yeah, so we'll, we'll be able to, a couple of you will be able to do it. Just stand on it, you hold this, and you take your feet, your uh, socks and shoes off, and this current will actually travel through your body uh, and tells you about the makeup of your body. So, like, for example, I don't know how well y'all can see this, but this was mine. I did these. Can y'all see these okay in your, in your book? Yeah. I, I scanned them so they didn't come in very well. But I gave you actually two of these scans. I did them for this class, actually. One was from 2014, and then one was from, what's the second one on the right? 2015. Yeah, it's from 2015. And in that time, I actually started, I started lifting weights because I had some injuries and various things. So I started lifting weights as a way to heal from that, and it really helped quite a bit. Uh, but if you notice here that my weight increased about 10 or 15 pounds, about 12 pounds, it's gone up since then uh, as I've continued lifting weights. But also notice here it gives a, this, um, this scanner gives you a distribution of your mass over your body. So I used to cycle a lot. And so my legs, it says, are over what they should be. Like they weigh more than the rest of my body in, with regards to the rest of my body. This isn't me, by the way. This is just a picture. I'm not sure if y'all are confused about that. <laughs> uh, whereas over here, after I started lifting weights, notice the upper body, which I had really begun focusing on because I was having these back issues and other injuries. My upper body then became over, and then my legs actually had become sort of normal. So it's pretty useful to help you understand, you know, where you are from a performance aspect in, in your body. and. Uh, Understand it can be useful for athletes too. Tells you other things about um, your weight and your uh, muscle mass and your body fat mass. Uh, like I said, we'll come back to that later at, at the end of the semester and we'll show it. But just for now, know that it, it measures current as it travels through your body and it allows you to measure.
muscle and body fat mass. This might make a good paper. Actually, there's these technology has evolved over the past decade or so. It used to be a lot like the e-meter. It just sent a single current through your body, and it would measure the resistance of your whole body. But now the scanner is actually quite a bit more complicated. It sends currents through your body of different frequencies, and those different frequencies sample different parts of your body. Because, you know, you got muscle mass, you have lots of fluids in your body, you have uh, body fat, and all those things are sampled differently by the different frequencies. That's why this in-body scanner is called, what is it called? It's called a multi-frequency scanner. It's not written here, but um, so if you wanted to do a, a, your paper, your final paper on that, you could do something like that. Ways to measure muscle mass are, are actually quite a big industry. All right, let's move on to the nervous system. Are there any questions about the body as a conductor? No, there's two devices. No, sort of how the body changes in resistance as you look at different paths through the body know that the body has resistance. You don't need to know the numbers, though, for the currents that I gave you from that table. You good? Yeah. All right. Well, let's look at the nervous system. Um, nervous system uses cells to transmit information, or uses nerve cells, rather, through the flow of electric charge. So it's a lot like current. It's not a current in the way that we think of it, but it is the flow of electric charge. So you can think of current flowing through these neurons. Uh, there are a couple purposes of the nervous system. There's a sensory input. There's integration. Number two. And then there's motor output. Those are the three main purposes of the nervous system. Um, the sensory input, it basically takes all the input from all your senses. Right? Uh, it processes, it is the uh, input from surroundings. We call that the external stimuli. and the other organ systems. And then we call these the internal stimuli. You know, things like, gosh, your body's getting kind of hot, need to do something about this, or your heart's beating kind of fast, need to do something about this. These sort of internal things that happen within our body that we might not necessarily have direct control over. Um, this is called the, um, this is part of the, peripheral nervous system. Was there a place to write that down? Uh, we'll get to that, but this is the peripheral nervous system. I'm sorry. We'll write that down in just a bit. Just write PNS for now. Uh, integration is it processes the sensory input. It's a lot like a computer. It takes the input. It processes the input. It processes that sensory input. And it determines what to do in response. We'll call this the central nervous system, and I'll write that down and define it more directly in a second. And then the motor output, uh, this is where the body responds. So the nervous system causes the body to respond. It might be voluntary or involuntary, like we talked about how the body cools itself, how it dilates or contracts the blood vessels in your skin. So it could be something like that, or it could be something that's voluntary. Right, that you're, it just leads your body, leads you to do these particular things, to respond to these uh, sensory input. So as I said, we have these two main parts to the nervous system, the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. And here's a picture of the central nervous system uh, and the peripheral. The central nervous system, it just includes the brain and the spinal cord. And what does the central nervous system do primarily? Or there was really only one purpose that was included the central nervous system, and that was this whole integration. So the brain and the spinal cord 
processes the sensory input and determines what to do in response. Or mostly the brain does that. Okay? And then the peripheral nervous system is the input-output you can think of. So uh, that would be sort of like the monitor and the keyboard on your, on your desktop computer, whereas the central part would be like the desktop computer itself. So the peripheral nervous system accomplishes the sensory input. And the central nervous system takes care of integration and sends information for motor output through the peripheral nervous system, the PNS. All right, so know the purposes of the nervous system, that uh, sensory input, integration, output. I said it's a lot like a desktop computer. The sensory input would be like your keyboard and the mouse. The integration would be like the desktop computer. And then the output would be, well, usually your monitor or your printer or stuff, stuff that it, you actually cause it to do. Uh, your peripheral nervous system, it consists of everything else in the nervous system, all the various nerves that go throughout your body. Uh, we've got two types of nerve tissue, the neurons and the support cells. We'll look more closely at the neurons than the support cells. The, um, the neurons actually transmit an electrical signal. All the support cells you don't know what they're called the neuro was a uh, neuroglia am I saying that right? Am I saying that right? All right do you know no you don't want to cover this in anatomy no okay the neuroglia they these provide various roles of support for the neurons. such as, for example, the myelin sheaths. Your book talked about this a bit. Your neurons, I have a picture of a neuron right here. Basically, you can think of it as sort of like a little computer. You receive input here. You process that input here. This is the uh, soma, which is the main body of the cell. And then you send that electrical signal along the axon and then down to the dendrites. And the axon is covered in these myelin sheaths. And it's sort of like, you can think of it as like the, uh, the insulator around an electrical wire. It, it helps to protect that electrical signal so that it's not degraded or changed in any way. So you can sort of think of this cell as being wrapped up in a piece of plastic to protect the current from getting out. All right, so those are the myelin sheaths. I'll, I'll write that down on that figure in just a second. Uh, right now, we're concerned with the, the neurons. So know that these support cells e exist, but you know, I'm not going to ask you much about them. However, for the neuron, you need to know all the major parts of the neuron. Right, you got the dendrites here. And then you got the uh, soma, or the cell body. This is the axon, and on the axon, you have these myelin sheaths, like an insulator. Uh, and then down here, you have the axon terminal. Uh, I don't think there's a picture in your book. Is there a picture in your, in your textbook for this? Was there? This is sometimes also called the synapses. And not all neurons look like this, but this is sort of your archetypal neuron. And you can think of electricity flowing in this direction. And then you would also have not just one neuron, because this is just you know basically cell size, but you'd have many neurons strung out. And so your electrical signal would, would go, would jump from neuron to neuron. It actually happens quite quickly. We'll talk about it, and it seems like it's a slow process, but it's actually a very quick process. 
So the neuron consists of um, a cell body. That's that soma. With dendrites and axons. Uh, the cell body is the main part of the neuron. Know what it does. Know what all these parts do, in fact. It controls the flow of electrical signals. It's sort of like the head of the uh, of the neuron. And then the dendrites, they receive the input signal. So you get these charges that come from a previous uh, neuron that will be received by the dendrites. They receive the input signals. And it sends to the cell body. The body, the cell body gets that input signal and processes it and says, you know, what's going to happen next. We'll talk about the criteria for sending that signal on. Uh, the axon transmits the signal. Oh, I'm sorry, transmits the signal. And sends to the dendrites on the next neuron. And the synapses are the, the connection between neurons. All right, know all the parts of the neuron. Oh, the synapses, those are also called those axon terminals. the synapses. They're also called that. And then the soma is also known as the cell body. Those are just two different names for the same thing. All right. So you got, uh, at the beginning, you receive a signal from a previous neuron on the dendrites. They pass that signal on to the cell body. The cell body says, should I pass the signal on or not? And it, if it does, it sends it down through the axon. Along here, the myelin sheaths along the way protect that electrical signal from being degraded. And then it comes down to the axons or the synapses. And at this point, it passes it on to the next neuron. And it goes on and on and on over gosh, millions or even billions of neurons in your body. All right, let's watch this little video. This is about the neuron. There's a, you ever heard of minute physics? This is sort of like, sort of like that. But apparently neuroscience is more complicated than physics. So it's two-minute neuroscience. But they have some really great videos about sort of the basics of um, the neuron and the brain and how that all works. Um, so anyway, know the different parts of the neuron. Uh, Let's see, the neuron also has lots of functions, and they're broken into just a few different classes. You have different kinds of neurons in your body. Um, the sensory neurons, these conduct input signals to the central nervous system. These account for our five senses, our sensory neurons. They allow us to have these five senses. Uh, the motor neurons conduct central nervous system signals. Uh, to the effector organs. When I say effector organs, they're organs that cause an effect out in the body. And of course, those will be muscles. Right? That causes motor output. But they can also be glandular. Like, for example, when we talked about the body changing temperature, constricting or dilating those blood vessels in the skin to cause you to cool or, or heat up, that's a, a glandular thing, not, not a, a muscle thing. And then the interneurons, or these are the in between the sensory and motor neurons.
All right. Let's look at the electrical properties of the neurons. So I got this, the sensory, the motor, and the interneurons. Maybe I'll just second to catch up. Any big plans this weekend, y'all? No? No plans? They're having the Cat 5K this weekend. I don't know if y'all like to do that kind of thing. But it's kernels against trafficking. Not like traffic like out on the road, but like human trafficking. I don't know if y'all know this, but there are people in Louisiana that are trafficked in various think kinds of slavery. Uh, all right. Can I move down from here? It's supposed to be at 8 a.m. on Saturday, but I think it might get moved to the afternoon. All right. Let's look at the electrical properties of the neuron. Like it's not exactly like electricity moving in a wire. It doesn't move in a neuron in the same way, but it's similar. Instead, ions, you know, those cations and anions, they move across the cell membrane. Perpendicular to the axon. So let me sort of, this is going to be my really bad representation of the neuron. Right, that's sort of my neuron with the, the soma down here and the synapses down here. Instead of getting current that flows directly from left to right, that's not what happens. Instead, you get this sort of transfer of charges into and out of this thing along the way. These charges move perpendicular to the axon. And then those charges moving perpendicular to the axon will actually propagate down along the entire axon. Okay, so these, these uh, charged particles will move in and out in a direction perpendicular to the axon, uh, creating this potential, like in a capacitive plate, like where you have a positive and a negative plate, there's a potential between those plates. And so I create this potential that propagates down the entire axon. Uh, the motion of these ions causes the potential to change. in the axon, and then this affects ions further down. Like I said, it's like this wave that propagates down the entire axon where the, the potential is changing, like a wave going down the axon. The electrical signal moves down the axon like a wave or a pulse on a string or rope. Right, I've done this before with the big ropes where you do like this. You know what I'm talking about? You do a single thing, and you can think of that as like the signal propagating down along the axon. It's very much like that. I mean, it's not a wave in the same way, but it acts very much in the same way, that it travels down the length of the axon. Right, you need to know what membrane potentials. It's a pretty important idea in how the neuron works. The axon has... Sodium, I mean p uh, potassium, excuse me, uh, cations, and then these are just negative ions. So this is potassium cations and anions. The anions are not, not potassium. They're just sort of other molecules in the cell. And these are separated. Uh, by the cell membrane from the sodium, these are cations, so they're positive, and chlorine ions, those are anions, so they're negative, uh, on the outside of the axon. All right. So this is inside the cell. You have this picture in your book. So I see my potassium cations and my other anions, which are different molecules. And then outside of the cell, we have these uh, chlorine and sodium ions. And then you'll also see that there's some other potassium ions there as well. But you get this separation of the charges. Now, there are more 
cations inside than out, and there are more sodium ions outside than in. And then there are a couple processes that will move these ions back and forth across the cell membrane. One of those is diffusion, right, that if I have um, a material where it's not very, uh, what's the word? Ah, shoot. I can't think of the word. Do you know what word I'm thinking of? Insert that word here, where there's not much of it. Uh, what is that word? Derek, what's that word? When you don't have much of something in a chemical thing? You're a chemist. Come on. <laughs> All right. Anyway, like uh, I used to wear cologne. I don't wear it anymore because it's, it's kind of goofy, right? But if you wear cologne, that's okay. All right. I'm not saying anything about you. But... <laughs> uh, but I had some cologne underneath the seat of my truck for some reason. I'm not sure why I had it there, but it was under there. And somehow the bottle sort of opened up. And so it diffused out into the atmosphere of my truck. And then it, it was terrible for like weeks because it never really left. Uh, but that is diffusion where you don't have, where you have a lot of something, it moves out into the areas of where you don't have a lot of that. It diffuses out to where there's not much of it. Oh, concentration. It's written right there. It moves from high to lower concentration. All right? So these ions will just move naturally because of diffusion. They'll actually move across the cell membrane. All right? So one of these processes is diffusion by which these ions move. Um, the sodium ions move inside the axon. So you get the sodium ions, which are moving in this direction, moving inside the axon. And the potassium ions will move outside the axon. So they'll move in this direction. So you get the sort of transfer of, um, of ions inside the, the neuron, inside the axon, or sort of in and out of it. And this is the called the concentration gradient. And so on this little figure, you have these gradients down here. It shows that, see, you have a lot of sodium ions on this side, but not many sodium ions on this side. So by diffusion, you get sodium ions to be moving in this direction. Here you have a lot of potassium ions on this side, but not many on this side. And so your potassium ions will move in that direction. And similarly, with chlorine here too, that they'll move from left to right as well. All right, so that's by diffusion. These ions can move through diffusion. And then because of um, the differing permeability in the cell membrane, For, so, uh, for potassium and sodium, those positive cations, more potassium ions will move out than the sodium move in. Right. So the membrane is less permeable for the potassium than it is for the sodium. So you're just going to get more potassium moving through the membrane than you would get for the uh, sodium. So that causes the inside of the axon to become more negatively charged. And it has a lower potential than the outside. There is a potential difference then between the outside and the inside. Because of this difference in permeability and because of these chemical gradients and how these ions move back and forth, I'm going to get more of a positive charge over here and I'm going to get more of a negative charge over here. So I'll get a low potential. I'll go back down in just a second. I'll get a low potential over here. And when I say low, you know, you think negative potential. And I'll get a higher potential over here. And when I say high, I mean positive. I get positive and negative. 
This is a lot like our capacitor plates. Remember our capacitor plates that we talk talked about earlier? That they have positive charges on one side, negative charges on the other side. I get high potential. I get low potential. I get this set up just because of the chemical processes that are going on. This sets up field lines inside of the plates. So my electric field runs from that side to that side. And so in a similar way, I have an electric field that's set up across the cell membrane. And then we'll see that it's actually going to cause charges to move in one direction or another. So if I have positive charges, they'll move in that direction. If I have negative charges, they'll move in that direction. Right, so very much like what we've been seeing, that we have this distribution of charges that's set up because of the chemical processes that are going on inside the axon, but they produce an electrical scenario where I have a potential difference between the two sides of the cell. The inside is negative, the outside is positive. Okay, can I go down from here? No? All right, so in summary, the potassium and sodium ions, they move by three mechanisms. The chemical gradient, and that causes potassium to go out and sodium to go in. The electrical gradient, because I have this difference in potential, these charges will move from either high to low potential depending upon their charge. The, sodium, uh, the potassium will go in, the sodium will go out. And then finally, this isn't something that we talked about, but uh, he talks about it in your book, is the sodium-potassium pump. If somebody asked about this, I don't know, recently. And the sodium-potassium pump causes the potassium ions to go in and the sodium ions to go out. I want you to know that these three processes go on. I want you to know that there's a negative potential inside of the cell because of these three processes. Both of those are pretty important ideas. Okay, as far as does the sodium go out, potassium go in, I'm not terribly concerned about that for the test. I, I want you to have heard it and sort of be familiar with it because you might see it again elsewhere. But I do want you to know that these three processes are important in the way ions move in the, in the, uh, the cell and then that it causes this negative potential inside the axon. So the net result is that the inside of the, the, inside of the cell is slightly negative. Giving it a resting potential. This is a term that we need to know. A resting potential of about minus 70 millivolts. That means when the cell is not doing anything, when it's not sending a signal, that the inside of the cell sits at about minus 70 millivolts. Okay? I'll show you a graph of that. Well, let's watch this. This is another video from that two-minute neuroscience. It's about the membrane potential. That means that what is that potential inside the cell? I think that's the end of this chapter. Well, let's do a few of these clicker questions. Let's do this first one over here on the uh, left. Which of these has parts of the body has a higher resistance? Inside the body or dry skin? Okay, let's stop at 25 or 26, we'll say. There you go. Okay, good. Dry skin does have a higher resistance. Now, of course, it depends upon how much dry skin you're talking about. But dry skin, as compared to the, the inside of your body, which is largely made of, you know, fluids and other, or water and other fluids, is a pretty good conductor of electricity. Uh, let's look at the one on the right here. In the neuron, the potential inside the cell is usually what? Is it positive, negative, zero, or is it neutral? In the neuron, the potential inside the cell is usually what value? Huh? 
All right, let's stop at 33, 33. Right, good. B is right. It's negative. That's that uh, membrane potential, that resting potential is about minus 70 millivolts. Let's do the strong stimulus affects the body. What will happen? Feel free to ask your neighbor what they put. All right, let's stop at 28. 28. Ask your neighbor if you're not sure. All right. Hey, look at y'all. Good. If you get 100%, you don't get a joke. You get advice. You want some advice? You know what you do if you're ever attacked by, I don't know, a group of clowns? Huh? Go for the juggler. All right, let's try this one about the end body. Oh, there's the full name of it. Direct segmental multi-frequency bioimpedance analysis device. Ask your neighbor. More have it right than wrong. I don't think we actually wrote this down. I said it in passing. But ask your neighbor what they put. Are right, many of you putting C or D? One of those is correct. All right. Let's stop at one minute. One minute. Okay, good. D is right. <laughs> you catch C because they... That's wrong. Yeah, that's okay. Uh, it uses these different frequencies of electricity will actually go through different parts of your body. So, like a, <coughs> a higher frequency might go through more through your torso and a lower frequency more so sort of the outer parts of your body. All right. That's our, the end body. The E-meter measures what? The current, resistance, voltage, or the electric field of the human body. This is the thing that's used as sort of like a psychological meter uh, to see what sort of thoughts you're having. All right, let's stop at uh, 30. 30. Okay, good. B is right. It measures the resistance. Now, current and voltage are, of course, involved in that, but really it's trying to determine what is the resistance of your body. And there's a little thing there, and like I said, if you have an anxious thought, the thing goes up or goes down or whatever. But it measures the resistance. Hey, do you know what the worst part about living on O Street is? I don't know if you've ever lived on O Street. Have you? There's not an O Street in Thibodeau. But do you know the worst part? You have to walk a whole block to pee. All right, what are the purposes of the nervous system? I think this is the end, isn't it? Yeah. But we're going to push on an optic. All right, I'll stop at 23, 23. A is right. So uh, the purposes of the nervous system are for its sensory input, integration, and motor output. Uh, now vision is part. Yeah, the eyes are not part of the. Uh, wait, are they? Are the eyes part of the nervous system? I don't think so. 
It's part of it. What? Are you asking Siri? <laughs> All right. Uh, let's move on to optics, okay? I know that y'all y'all ready to go or whatever. We still have 15 minutes. And so I want to move on to optics. Remember, I, I sort of have this goal that we'll have our test, and I think that there's general consensus that y'all want to do that, have our test before the last day of class, and that way you don't have to come for a final. Right, general consensus, is that true? It's TBA now anyway, but I, I think that that's, I, I would like to do that, and this is sort of a hurdle to that. Um, All right, so we're going to deal with electromagnetic waves, and light consists of these electromagnetic waves where the electric and magnetic fields oscillate back and forth. In fact, that's how people often draw light waves, that you have an electric field that will change back and forth, and then you'll also have a magnetic field that will also change back and forth. You have your uh, electric, and then you have your magnetic field. It actually turns out that they're perpendicular to one another, but that's not terribly important for this class. But you get this changing electric field and a changing magnetic field, and so it acts a lot like a wave. In fact, it is a wave. Uh, electromagnetic waves or light, that, that it is a wave, and it has wave-like properties, which we've already seen in the, the chapter on sound. It works much in the same way as sound. Uh, these Electromagnetic waves are actually caused by moving electrons. And so if you've ever seen a radio antenna, let me check my thing down for you. If you've ever seen a radio antenna like, where it's just like a metal pole that sticks up, right, maybe on the back of a van, you see those folks, they have that really tall antenna that comes up off the back of their van. That's because they're ham radio operators or shortwave radio operators. And those antennae are used to receive signals, but then they're also used to transmit radio signals. Now, radio is a type of light, right? There are all different types of light, not just the type of light that you see. But on these radio antennas, you have electrons. And they move up, and then they move down. And what they do is they cause the electric field to change. And then they also cause the magnetic field to change, and they send that out into space. These electrons move up and down, and they use a circuitry to cause those electrons to move up and down at a particular uh, rate. But that's largely all they're doing, is they're just causing electrons to move up and down the antenna for transmitting signals. Now, when they're receiving signals, the signals come in, and those signals cause the electrons to move up and down. It's just the reverse of this process. Uh, and then how those antenna, how the electrons move up and down tells them what kind of signal they're receiving. So that's largely how a radio transmitter works. What is this wiki page? Let me see. Uh, I don't remember this on Wikipedia. Let's take a look. Sorry, guys. I should have looked this up earlier. Mm. Okay, I'm not seeing it. It's not important. Or maybe it was important, but I think it was just a simulation that shows those electrons moving up and down and actually generating those uh, electron, the electric and magnetic fields. Right, so moving electrons generate generate electromagnetic fields or electromagnetic waves. And electromagnetic waves have the same wave properties as other waves, right? Remember we talked about the speed of the wave. We talked about the wavelength. We talked about the frequency. They have all those same properties because they're waves, just like the sound waves. So part of this chapter will uh, 
be a lot like what we saw in the sound chapter, which will be test. The, the test is on that next time. Yeah, the sound chapter, which will be tested on on Tuesday. So all electromagnetic waves travel at the same speed in a vacuum. And if you'll remember, remember we talked about sound, and we said that one thing about sound is that it requires a medium. They said if we sucked all the air out of this room, what would happen to the propagation of sound in this room? You wouldn't hear you sound couldn't like oh. It would just you wouldn't hear anything because the uh it requires a medium. But the fact is that electromagnetic waves, because they're a little bit different from sound waves. Remember sound waves are condensations, they're pressure waves or longitudinal waves. They actually cause differences in pressure in the medium. That's not what EM waves do, or these electromagnetic waves. So they don't need a medium to travel through space. Uh, they all travel at the same speed, and that speed is equal to 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second, which you know is 3 with four, five, 6, 7, 8, what's that? 300 million meters per second. All right, so that's our speed of light. Um, this, by the way, is the same C that you see in E equals MC squared. You don't need to know that, but just sort of that, that is that same speed of light that we see in that famous equation, E equals MC squared. All right, may I go down from here? Yeah. All right, the electromagnetic spectrum has a range of frequencies. Uh, you do need to know the electromagnetic spectrum. It runs from gamma rays on one end to X-rays, to ultraviolet, to the visible, which is that Roy G. Biv, to the infrared, to microwave, and to radio. So we're running now from uh, big energy. So energy is big down here, high energy. We have a high frequency, but we have a small wavelength. And on this end, we have low energy. Radio waves have a very low energy. That's the type of waves that your cell phone uses. So that's good that they have a low energy so it doesn't affect, you know, your body. They have a low energy. They have a low frequency. But they have a very long wavelength. And the wavelengths can be centimeters long. The waves can be like this big. Or they can be meters long. Or they can even be kilometers long. Many, many hundreds or even thousands of kilometers long. You can have radio waves that are bigger than the Earth. And they can travel through space and just not even see the Earth, just go straight through the Earth because the wavelength of these waves are so large. Uh, I like to draw little arrows. So if you think about this, the energy runs like this. The frequency runs like this. And the wavelength does the opposite. It goes in that direction. If you remember when we saw sound, we had the speed of the wave was equal to the wavelength times the frequency. Remember, this is an inverse relationship. If f gets big, wavelength gets small. And that's what's happening here. That's why we have this crisscross between the wavelength and the frequency. Uh, the energy of an electromagnetic wave is given by the frequency. They give this formula in your book. The energy is equal to H times F. So notice up here that the red and the blue lines, they track along. That when you have low energy, that means you have a small frequency. And when you have high energy, that means you have a high frequency. So like gamma rays, for example, have a very high energy. Gamma rays can affect your body, actually damage your body. And they also have a very high frequency. That the energy is dependent upon the frequency. Uh, this H is a constant. You don't need to know the value for it, it's just, but you need to know that it's just a constant. It's called Planck's constant. I'll give you the value, but like I said, you don't need to know it. It's 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34. All right. Um, here's a calendar. I mean, not a calendar. A uh, What's this called? A rainbow. Thank you. You can color your rainbow if you want. Remember, it goes from red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and then violet. 
If you have a video I want to show you, and then we can wrap up. We'll stop here.